So welcome. Uh, my name is Terrell Russell. I work uh, on iRods, and I'm going to talk a little bit about data management design patterns today. I work at the iRods Consortium, which is an organization under uh, the Renaissance Computing Institute, uh, RENSI, which itself is one of 60 or 70 institutes at uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, data management. And so first of all, why does it matter? It turns out that as your data gets older and more broad audience, the policy that you need to have changes over time. So with a flexible system like ours, uh, we think it's the best uh, answer for going through this life cycle and dealing with your changing policy needs. So iRods itself is a piece of open source uh, software. It runs in a distributed manner on lots of different computers. We talk about it being data centric, but metadata driven. And it allows you to abstract your infrastructure and then actually make it programmable. So as your policy needs, ch needs change, you can change your policy, write new code, and take care of uh, the things you need to do. We do four things. We do data virtualization, which means we abstract your uh, different storage. We have a metadata catalog where you can write things down. And then we have a rule engine where you can write your code to define your policy and take action on your data based on the metadata in the system. And then we also federate with other instances of ourselves, which is a big deal because that means uh, when you federate, your policy is enforced. When you talk to someone else who's running iRods, their policy is enforced if you're talking to their data. So iRod sits in the middle. People have bought all kinds of things already. It's called the existing infrastructure and sunk cost. So we see ourselves as a bit of glue that abstracts that uh, different sunk cost uh, between storage, compute, different types of authentication. And it sits between that and the different types of clients and users that you might have. This allows your uh, infrastructure to change over time, but provide a common namespace and an kind of an insurance policy as things change. We've been around for a long time, so the first 10 years of, of this project was because grid storage was hard, and so you get federal money for that. And then when that works, they don't give you any money anymore. The next 10 years was about writing a policy engine, and then we figured that out, and they stopped giving you money. And they expect a market solution to show up, so we are now a consortium driven by membership. We've been doing this for about four years. We've got membership uh, around the world. Uh, DDN is one of our first members, and we're very thankful. So the process that we go through to do all of the work that we do is very community driven. Uh, we have support requests, uh, obviously lots of feedback and bug reports. We institute uh, working groups when we have we start to hear these patterns from multiple users and we want to kind of consolidate the language. We obviously work on use cases and different proofs of concept once uh, it's time to write some code. And, but all of this is done with the expectation that the work that we're doing is going to be in the public eventually. We, we do sign NDAs, we do say, do things under contract, but eventually the idea is that people uh, will be sharing what they've learned at the infrastructure level and actually compete on what they do. And so the main takeaway after all this work is that the common enabling practice turns out to be annotation that means something. And AKA, that's, that just means metadata, right? These are simple strings that you attach to something they don't mean anything by themselves. The meaning comes because you have policy that cares about that particular string. That's, that's, that's bad. That's bad and this annotation can be both descriptive and prescriptive, right? You can tell a story about what has happened to the data. You can tell a story about what state your system is in. You can annotate what things mean. But you can also actually encode your intent for what you want to have to happen to your data in the future. So. If you annotate something and say that this should be over there next week, you've got policy that can come along, care about that annotation, and then take action on it. So if it's all about metadata, you have to have the ability to put that everywhere. And so we have the ability to annotate the users in your system, obviously the files, the collections, but also the storage resources. So if you've got a particular set of uh, storage that has uh, a particular feature set, like it's super fast, or it's really old and super slow, or if you have something that uh, all the compute that you need is over here, this one has all the GPUs, or this one has uh, HIPAA compliant or something like that, uh, you can annotate those, and that doesn't mean anything until you have policy that comes along and cares about that annotation. But the idea is that you can annotate anything in the system. 
And what we found is that with the appropriate abstractions, which we think we provide, everything in a particular system can be described in that way, and therefore any action in that system can be driven by the metadata, which means at this point you're writing code. Instead of having humans in charge of the policy, you're actually writing code, which can be versioned and deployed, that takes care of uh, enforcing that policy around your system. We've detected a few different patterns. The first one is that you have to have good metadata. So we've now created and instituted a working group that talks about metadata templates. If, you're, if your metadata is no good, then what are you going to do about that? Right? The rest of these are different use cases that we've seen across different industries, different uh, disciplines, different science domains. Uh, everyone has a landing zone and ingest problem. Maybe you have lots of satellites and lots of sequencers and all kinds of stuff like that, putting data in your system fast. Everyone has a replication use case. Most people have a tiering use case once they're doing it at scale. Archiving, you could have a policy where your archiving is actually to delete all your stuff, right? The lawyers usually don't want to have stuff hang around for a while, but that is in itself a policy. Uh, if you've got regulatory things that you need to meet, you've got an auditing requirement, we can help you with that. And we've seen patterns around that. And, this, and the last two are data to compute and compute to data. And I'll have a slide uh, on those in a second. So in terms of making sure that your data is your metadata is good, since it's the thing that powers your policy engine, we've defined a, a JSON format, and we've done this through collaboration with uh, three or four different institutes around the world that are working on this problem, trying to solve it in a good way. If you've got a JSON description of your metadata, your UI can be deployed, but it can be intelligent. It can actually react to the description of the metadata that you want. So if you define it, a certain metadata element to be in a certain range, the UI can actually draw a slider or a drop down in a certain way and make that UI kind of more universal for you. The light definition of these things allows for many to many application between the metadata templates and the things that they're being applied to, so it's very flexible. And then perhaps the most important is the validation and enforcement capabilities. So if you've got humans entering metadata, right, but they missed a couple or they spelled something wrong, you can come along and validate that very cleanly and say this is not this is out this is in violation and it's not ready to move to stage two or stage three. As well, you can actually enforce that at the front door and say this is no good. It's not eligible to be in our system at all. So once you've got good metadata being enforced automatically by policy, it en it enables all these different use cases. So these different elements of what we've heard from the community, we've now done work on all of these with different people. And every one of these is basically representing a multiple, multi-billion uh, dollar industry, right? There are hardware vendors and selling things that do storage tiering right now. They're relatively expensive, right? If you've got compliance needs, you can pay someone a lot of money to help you be compliant. Or perhaps you can write a few rules and set a few policies, which will allow you to be compliant automatically. If you've got publishing needs, if you need to coin uh, DOIs, um, if you've got a provenance issue that you need to work with. You know, all of these things now are just a matter of defining the right policy to make you happy. Right? At this point, you're having a hard conversation inside your organization about what it is that we want to do, as opposed to having a technical conversation about what's hard and what's not possible and what's expensive. So we've found that most people show up. They don't want to spend too much effort on the front door. They want a proof of concept that shows that this stuff works. So on the left-hand side of the scale, you can do you know, you can use your existing scripts. You've already got a process. Changing the culture is much harder than changing the technology. So, you know, use the same scripts. Don't worry about making the scientists have to change what they do. Or eventually, if you want to make stronger assertions about what's happening to your data inside your system, you can start to integrate that much more deeply. You can start off with some scripting languages. You can write things uh, kind of to prototype very quickly. If you need them for speed, you can start to write things in C++ and hook in, and you've got full speed of your, uh, of your hardware. Same thing with provenance, and the same thing with automation. You know, everybody starts with vigilance, but eventually you'd like to have some code that, that backs that up. In terms of the provenance and reporting, for those of you that need to do that, um, you, can be, you can be reactive, or you can, with more effort, you can move and be more proactive. So if you need to do particular types of reports for the FDA or for uh, some other regulatory in, uh, agency, you're going to need to do that every Thursday, right? Or whatever the, the, the time is. So you can spend some time, write your policy down, produce these reports automatically, and now you don't have to have the, the two or three weeks of kind of frantic uh, running around getting everything lined up when the, the, when the auditor shows up. 
So the last two slides are really about data to compute and compute to data. So this is something that we've seen basically everywhere. Everyone has an ingest question. Everyone has a replication question. Everyone needs to do some science, write it down, and have that provenance tied back to it. So this allows things to come in at pace. They get into the namespace. You can extract metadata. You can annotate things. You can tell it where you want this data to live inside your long-term storage. When the time is right, you can annotate things. Policy will come along and move it to your parallel file system. This is largely presented as an on-premise solution because you've paid for something shiny, something big and fast. You can now automatically stage it to the fast stuff. Your science can happen. And then in the landing zone on the other side, you can take the results and pull them back into the namespace. And you've got full provenance from you know, the color of the laser and whatever came out of the Petri dish all the way to the publication of your data and uh, perhaps award-winning research, right? Alternately, in case your data is too big, too heavy, you're not allowed to move it, it has to stay in Germany, whatever reason, if you can't move your data around, you can move your compute to the data. It's usually cheaper to move the math to the data than moving the data. So if you've got some computers in the middle that are annotated with those GPUs, this one's annotated with being HIPAA compliant, you've got some science that needs to run there, you can actually annotate the science job that needs to run, and it will get routed appropriately to the right computers. So going through this process, going through this process has been a very uh, community-driven thing, and we've decided that this is the best way to do it. But it's also very hard and very slow; it takes a lot of time. Uh, but it does set clear expectations, and I think the most important part about this process is that it actually shared. Uh, it, it results in a shared language. That's actually the hardest part of all this, is getting people who were not using the same words to agree on what it is that they're trying to do together and create these kind of generic use cases and, and design patterns to understand, to communicate in the future and shorten that, that uh, runway for the next customer that needs to solve some of these problems. It produces a strong culture of sharing, which we like, and I think the, the product in terms, uh, in the end, is better because you know, we've heard lots of different voices. I think that's the last slide. So thank you very much. If you've got any uh, questions, uh, you can talk to me now or talk to me later. We're over in uh, booth 437. Thank you very much.